Yo, this Atomic Salon right here. I, when it first got, when it first opened up, because like when Atomic Salon opened, they were the coolest shit. Like mm -hmm. everybody can go get that. They're cool. It designs in their hair. They can get their hair cut. I went there one time and I didn't know, like, <laughs> I didn't know what the cool haircuts were. Like, cause I mean, dude, I didn't even you know, my dad used to cut my hair. Like he just shaved my head like an asshole. So <laughs> I go in there and I look, I'm getting a fade and they're just like, oh, like what, what size do you want? You want like a one? And I'm like, sure. Like, I don't fucking know what the hell that means. I'm just like, oh, just make me look like that guy. Dude, they shave my fucking head. Like, it's, just, it's like, I mean, like, stubble. And then they look in the mirror and like, is that what you wanted? And in my head, I'm like, I want to blow this place up. But I'm like, nah, dog, this shit's tight. Fuck yeah, man. And I'm like walking the street, put my hat on, and I'm like, everybody's going to beat me up in school tomorrow. <laughs> like, what an asshole I am. I look like a broken condom. Like, what the fuck, man? Oh, fuck. I hate that place. I haven't been to a Tommy Salon since. gave the money for training like they just took my money and like I like they would just sit in the in the seats and watch me fall down and hurt myself nobody ever trained me the right way from from the beginning which was horrible JT Dunn came from uh, an area of people that were more considered untrained backyard type stuff uh, first impressions of JT Dunn um, first thing I saw was small guy I never was taught like etiquette. I was never taught shake everybody's hand in the locker room. So I would just walk in, sit down, get dressed. And then I would just go do my thing. And nobody ever told me, hey, you are messing up. Like you're not gonna last long. And I, and I, I felt that a lot of people didn't like me, but I never knew why. I'm like, ah, oh, they're jealous of me because I'm super awesome at wrestling. And like looking back at it, I'm just like, Whoa, I can't believe I even had that thought in my brain. I just heard things in several different locker rooms that he was an asshole. About four years in is when I like met Dave Cole and he really opened my eyes to like how wrestling really is. And then there was guys like Tripleicious who pull, who would pull me aside and, and really helped me. And um, I started training with a local guy named Brickhouse Baker who kind of had his hand uh, in almost uh, all the top guys in New England have passed through uh, Baker's uh, knowledge at some point. And he was, he was the guy who kind of showed me the in-ring stuff because he's very old school, uh, very fundamentals, basic oriented. And that's what I needed because I was athletic. I could do 450s, I could do moonsaults, but it's like, I didn't know why I was doing them. I didn't know how to get to them. I just knew I was gonna take a beating until that guy was laying down. And as soon as he laid down, I was gonna do a 450. I didn't understand how to do any of that stuff. When I would go to train with Brickhouse, man, he would work me like a, like, like a mule, man. He would be, and there was no breaks. He would just beat the shit out of me and like, sh like just stretch me out and everything. And, and like, I hated it. And like, I would throw up all the time. Like, you think you're in shape. You're like, wrestling shape and like athletic shape and football shape are all different things. Like, I can go and get on a treadmill for, and just run for like three hours. Uh, I could not run for three hours in a wrestling ring and have a three hour long wrestling match. Like it's just such a different dynamic. Uh, and I didn't know that. So like my, my mind was so arrogant to the way that I needed to be to sort of survive in a wrestling ring. And he was the first guy to really break the outs, the inside of the ring stuff. And then around that time, Dave Cole was helping me like fix my actual life. Uh, and I don't think Dave really realized it at first that like we were becoming best friends. Like, <laughs> like I knew it because I was just like, I need to see Dave. Like I, I was trying to get booked on shows where Dave was just so I could go there and hang out with him and just listen to him talk. Meeting guys like Tripleicious who really helped me. Uh, he's another guy in New England who's like, he's cut his teeth here and he's been here for so long and, and like, he's still wrestling now and people don't realize it, man. He's been around for like 15 years and he's worked with all of the guys that are like went to go on top in wrestling like they've all passed through here like they've all shared the ring with him uh so like i had the opportunity in providence here at pwf northeast to kind of jump and do like a rivalry with him that was like some of my most fun times because i was constantly learning and he was the first guy i got to get in the ring with and kind of just like go do it 
Like it wasn't about like what cool spot we're gonna do or like what reckless thing we're gonna do. It was just like, hey man, like let's just go out there and fight. So like I, I was finally getting my head on straight with Dave. Brickhouse was showing me the things I needed to do to survive in the ring. And then Trips was showing me like how to put it all together. I was booked against him. I thought we had a really good match. It was one of the matches, uh, he says it's like one of his breakout type matches where he's finally able to start working uh, more names and stuff. And I still looked at it as, um, he still had work to do, but he was a lot better than I thought he was gonna be. Um, I saw a lot of promise in him and stuff. Um, a couple little sloppy things, but he was still pretty young and pretty green at that time. So, he had a lot of bad things going in. He proved all those things that people, other people had said not to be true. The one thing that I picked up from JT was that he was really good at selling. Um, he could take a beating and really, I mean, I, I, maybe that's the story of JT's career is that people don't really realize it, but he's so good at making his opponent look good, um, which, which is a difficult thing to do because a lot of times when that happens, it puts the focus back on yourself. Um, so in that regard, he's very selfless. One day, JT texted me and he was like, yo, I'm at this place, it would be perfect for wrestling. And I was just like, what's the name of it? And he's like, ah, oh, I think it's called like Feet or something like that. And I was like, dude, you're at Fet Music, like get the hell out of here. I was like, I'm gonna give you my word on this. You get us in there, you find me the person that I need to talk to to make it happen, you pick one opponent that you wanna wrestle above anybody else, I will make that match happen for you. And by the end of the night, he had the contact information for Lizzie, who was the first person that booked us at Fet. We set up a meeting with her. We both dressed up. We were like, this is never gonna happen. Everybody that runs wrestling hates wrestling. You know, they, they, they hate the fact that wrestling's there. They tell other places not to book it. Um, you know, it's a music venue. It's not a wrestling venue. And uh, little did we know, like we showed up and like she had already made up her mind. Like she wanted us in there. Um, and so I was like, all right, JT. Like, I remember we went to Julian's on Broadway. We got breakfast. And I was like, so who do you want to wrestle? And he was like, Johnny Gargano. And I was like, done deal. We made it happen just like that. That was the moment where everything turned around for Beyond Wrestling and JT played a huge part in that by being able to be the one to finally get the connection at Fet Music. And not only that, but it's like he did the match with Gargano. It could have been like a one and done type thing, but he really won over the crowd. And that was when I saw, okay, JT can hang at this level. But after I wrestled Johnny Gargano in American Rana, I became more confident in myself in the ring. It allowed me to really focus on myself outside of the ring. That's when I kind of was like, in my brain, like, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do it forever. I'm going to, I, I don't give a fuck about the money. I'm going to be the best professional wrestler in the world. Like, I want people in five years to talk about me the same way they talk about AJ Styles. I want people to talk about me the same way they talk about Samoa Joe and CM Punk and Chris Hero. Like, I'm gonna be that fucking guy. And so I thought if JT had good chemistry with Johnny Gargano, he's gonna have outstanding chemistry with Michael Elgin. JT and Michael Elgin was the moment where people realized JT Dunn is not a fluke. And he had so much momentum behind him that it was like, all right, like this is our guy that we're gonna build a tournament for tomorrow around. And he went to the finals against Green Ant. And that was on a show where Biff Busick and Eddie Edwards wrestled a rivalry concluding hour long Iron Man match. So to be able to go out there and perform at that level and still send the fans home happy, uh, delivering in a main event capacity. I mean, that, that was, those were the three shows like within a four month period that everything came together for JT. I was never told like, hey, you can be anything you wanna be. Like if you wanna be successful, go for it, son. I was told you're a loser and you're probably gonna die before you're 25. My room was the one with the air conditioner in it on the second floor. So when I was when I was there as younger, I mean, this is like, you're like 13, 14 years old when you start sneaking out of your house, stuff like that. I used to have to jump out that window, be on the platform of the door and uh, you can't really see it now, but there's like a white, uh, like a little ornament thing that hangs there. And I used to have to like slither down, like hold on to it. And then, and then it's like an eight foot drop. So like I'd have to drop down. And if every time I do it, I'd sneak out. I'd always forget that now it's an eight foot jump that I have to do when I have to go back into my room so my dad doesn't find me. I was saying to you before we, when we, when we were first getting here, man, I haven't been here since 2008. Like, this, this neighborhood, as many good memories as I have here, I have probably more negative memories. Uh, so like I told myself, like once I got out of here, like I just, I just wasn't coming back. Like I didn't, I didn't want to be here anymore. 
like it just was chaos like so they're like this was like a lot of drugs were sold in the street like i was always younger like the dudes i hung out with were like 21 22 23 i'm 14 15 years old yeah so it was it was a very different thing and i was like the youngest kid but nobody ever treated me like a kid i've seen some shit man and it's just like it's all happened like all based off of it. this little bendy curve that house it just it it knows all my all my secrets because everything i did and everything that i was no matter how far i, I try to get away in those times everything led to this bend and coming back to this fucking stupid house one of the things that i try to like instill in people's minds like before you say something negative to somebody and before you put somebody down think for one second of all the hardships that you've had what do you think they've been through? Nobody's had a perfect life. There's not one person who's born perfect and passes away perfect. It just doesn't happen. We all make mistakes. We all do things. We all have things that we have to live with. Like if I, I, I don't think I was ever meant for like, like a proper life. Like I don't think I was meant to have like a, a mom and dad who loved me and a family who took care of me and like, like three square meals on my, on my table every day. Like I am very different and I've always kind of been that way. So this lifestyle, as much as I hated it and as much as I disapprove of it, and now I fight against it. These, these concrete fucking streets have made me into who I am now. And like, it's just so nuts being back here for so long. Because like, I mean, it's cool in to a degree because now I feel at peace and I've accepted all the things that are negative about this area. And I mean, I was telling people leading into today that I was I was very nervous. I mean, you could probably hear it in my voice. Like, I'm just I'm just nervous because like this whole thing really set the tone for the rest of my life and to who I am now in 2015. And it's just like I, I don't hate this place anymore. When we were pulling up, I hated this fucking place. Then I was just like, and I was second guessing myself. And now I'm just like, man, like it is because of this stuff. Like this this was such an important part of my life. Yeah. And I stayed away since 2008. And I, like, We have pro right. wrestling savior, the juice, JT Dunn. JT, welcome back to the Strike Zone. I appreciate having me back. You're uh, you're throwing that special word out real easily. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, oh. you're on the rise, and uh, you know you got a big match coming up on uh, Sunday. That's with what AJ they're saying. Styles. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited for it. Like how special Sunday at XWA really is for me. I want everybody to celebrate. I want it, it's not just a good day for me, it's not just a great match for me. This is a great match for Rhode Island. This is a great match for XWA. This is a great match for wrestling fans. You guys come here because you want to succeed. You want to be better pro wrestlers. So you wouldn't be here. Like... Yeah, no, yeah. Oh, God. I was like, okay, got it. And I was like, wait, you don't got it? And I was like, oh, why am I in the corner? <laughs> By my buddy Uha Nation, Paul Cruz. Yep. Like I used to make this joke with him. Uh, every time I work out, I was trying to get Uha swole. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just pursue, you know, following my dreams and you know, making something out of myself. And, you know, just having him there at that moment when the Sandlot Cup was, was unbelievable. 